In this example, we're going to use the Daggety and ggdag packages in R to draw DAGs and causal diagrams and figure out adjustment sets and do all of the other DAG logic that we've been talking about. Um, so go ahead and open R Studio, and you can follow along here. Um, I'm just going to come and go to new file, new R Markdown file. Um, you can also do this in an R script. It doesn't have to be R Markdown. We're just, we've been using R Markdown in this class, so that's what we'll do here. I'm just going to leave all of the default options and click OK. Um, it has all of this placeholder text here. It's generally best to just select from under the metadata and delete it so that we're left with just the metadata here. Here we can just say DAG examples. Sure. OK. So to do this, um, we need to load a few different packages. Um, I'm going to insert an R chunk here um, using the insert menu. You can also do this with command option I or, con or control alt I if you're on Windows. Um, I want to load the tidyverse library. Technically, you don't need to do this um, because ggdag will work without tidyverse stuff, but it's just generally good practice to load tidyverse in case you want to do any tidyverse related things like um, manipulate data sets or use ggplot, other things like that. Um, we're also going to load um, the ggdag package, and we're going to go to library dagity package. So we're going to load these three libraries. If this doesn't work on your computer, if you run it and it complains about ggdag not being found, um, you can go to the Packages panel, click on Install, and then you should be able to type ggdag and install it from CRAN, um, and then it'll be on your computer. You only have to do that once. Once it's on your computer, you should be good. Um, so I'm going to run this chunk here so I can actually load those libraries. Um, if you notice, it should have a whole bunch of errors, and or not errors, but warnings and messages that will pop up here. Um, that's helpful information, but if we knit this thing, then all of those would be in the knitted document, and we don't necessarily want that. So if I come to this gear icon, I can modify the chunk options here, and I can tell it to not show warnings and to not show messages. And now if I apply, you'll see here it says message equals false, warning equals false. You could actually type that by hand as well. So now if I run the chunk, there should be no warnings and messages, and it's all nice and clean. Okay, so we have um, our chunk here. So we want to actually draw a DAG. Um, so to do that, you have to do it in two steps. You create a DAG object that has all of the different relationships between the nodes that you want, and then you plot that object. Um, so we're going to insert a new chunk here, and we're going to make a DAG, and we're just going to call it simple underscore DAG. This can be named whatever you want. We could name it cat. We could name it ASDF. We could name it super cool DAG with all sorts of nodes. Um, doesn't matter what it's called. We'll just call this one simple DAG. Um, then I'm going to use this backwards arrow assignment um, uh, character here. You can either type that by actually manually typing the less than and then the minus sign, or you can use option minus or alt minus on Mac and Windows, and it'll do it for you. Um, so we're going to use a function called dagify, which will create a dag. Um, and then we're going to assign the output of dagify here to this object or variable called simple dag. And then we can do stuff with that simple dag. Um, the dagify function, if you look at the help file for it, if we come to help and then search for dagify, um, it should have a whole bunch of different examples of, of how to use it, especially if you scroll down. It'll say, like, dagify y is caused by x plus z, and x is caused by z. Um, that's how you can kind of build the different relationships there. It has a whole bunch of other documentation. If you Google ggdag, there's a whole bunch of tutorials written by the, the author of the package that you can follow, and it's going to be super helpful. Um, on this resources page, I have, or on this guide, I have a whole bunch of different code examples that show how you can do different things with dagify. Um, and so you can get practice with that. Um, so 
the basic way Dagify works is, is you specify um, using formulas, the same formula notation that you've been using with models, um, you specify all the different relationships between nodes. And I typically like to do this on its own line just because they can get kind of long and hairy. So I'm going to press enter here. So I have Dagify open parentheses and then closing parentheses. And so I'm just going to build a simple DAG that just has um, four nodes in it. We'll do that. So we'll say that Y is explained by x plus a plus b. So this is just saying that x causes y, a causes y, and b causes y. Then if I do a comma, I can specify other formulas here. So I can say that x is explained by a plus b. So that means a is causing x and b is causing x. If you look at this this is kind of hard to see, but basically what we did is we said that A and B are confounders. A and B cause X and they cause Y, and then X also causes Y here. But uh, So we have that confounding relationship in there. Um, this gets really tricky to do. What I do whenever I'm doing a DAG here in code is I'll draw the DAG in Daggity on the website or on paper or something, and then I'll refer to that as I'm typing it into the into R, so I can make sure I have all of the arrows right and I can see what's connecting to what node, because um, just doing this in your head is going to be really, really hard. Um, so if I run this chunk now, it should create a thing here called simple DAG. If I click on it here, uh, it probably won't actually show anything in our studio. Nope, it doesn't know what to do with it. It's just this simple DAG. So we need to actually look at it. So what I'm going to do is hit enter a couple times here, scroll up. Um, if we want to plot this thing, there's a cool function called ggdag, and we can feed it our simple dag. So now if I run this chunk, it will generate this dag object, and then it should plot it, and it should look like that. So now we have x causing y, a causing y, and x, and b causing y, and x, um, which is great. There's our confounders, um, there's our causal relationship x leading to y, and everything's delightful. Um, one problem, though, is if you notice, if we plot it again, it looks different. Um, if we plot it again, it's going to look different. And that's kind of annoying. Um, in the documentation for ggdag, it shows how you can specify your own coordinates. Um, so you can think about this as like a grid system with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 or however many numbers you want, and you can say, I want the A node to be at 1, 3. I want B to be at 5, 3. So you can actually manually line this up. You can also let it randomly line it up, which is what it's doing by default here. Um, but every time you run it, the randomness is going to be different. Um, to get around that, um, I think you can... Ah, you can't do it here. Um, what you can do is you can set what is called a seed. And we'll talk about this later in the semester. What this essentially does is it makes sure that any random numbers that R chooses will be the same random numbers every time this is run. So if we say set seed one, two, three, four, it doesn't matter what we type here, it's just kind of a number we type. You can do one, three, four, five, you can do one, 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 you can do nine, you can do whatever you want. I typically just do one, two, three, four. Um, if you run set seed and then plot it, it's going to choose the same random numbers every time. So now if I run this chunk again, notice how A and B are here, X is pointing down at Y, B is slightly higher than A. If I click on play again, it should be identical. Yep. And I run it again, and it should be identical again. And that's because the set seed thing is just saying make the random numbers, the positions, the same every time. Um, if you don't like that, you can change it to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's see how that ends up. Um, there's no way of knowing beforehand how this is going to look. So you say, ah, it looks cool. Now X is at the bottom. And B and A are more kind of horizontally aligned. That's great. So we'll just stick with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 here. So there's our simple DAG that we wrote or that we built with R here. Um, Inside the dagify function, we can do other things. Right now, R has no idea that Y is our outcome and that X is our exposure or our treatment. So we can tell that, uh, we can define those things here in dagify. So if I do a comma, I can come here and I can say exposure 
equals, and then in quotes, I can say it's x. That's the main thing we care about. x is causing y. So the exposure is x, and then our outcome is y. So now if I run this, it should look the same. Nothing actually happened. Um, but internally, the simple DAG object knows that x is the exposure and y is the outcome. But we're not doing anything with the plot to make it show that. So if we want it to, to actually show which of these nodes is the treatment and which of them is the outcome, instead of using ggdag, we can use a function called ggdag underscore status. And this will color each of the nodes by what they are, um, by if they're treatment or outcome or unobserved. So now if we look at it, we have an exposure, we have our outcome, and we have these other things. So that's cool. Um, if you don't like this background with the, the grid and with the, the axis labels, because who really cares that this is at 5.5 and 9, um, you can turn all of that off if you add, so after ggdag status, we do a plus sign, we're going to add a layer to our plot here called theme underscore dag. And what this will do is basically get rid of all of that extra chart stuff, and it should leave us a nice clean plot that looks like that. So no more grid lines, no more axis labels or anything. That's just our DAG. Um, neat. So now it's it's coloring everything based on whether it's exposure or outcome, and that's delightful. Um, another thing we can do is instead of saying A and B and X and Y, those are kind of abstract, we can make these be exact. Um, there's nothing magical about what I've typed here with Y and X and A and B. You don't always have to have the treatment be Y. You don't always have to be the, have the exposure be X. You can type whatever you want here. The only rule for typing in these formulas is you can't have spaces. Um, and they can't start with numbers. Um, so we could actually, instead of using Y, we could say that this is our outcome, is explained by our program. And then we just need to make sure that that's consistent throughout. So our program is now explained by A and B. Um, our exposure is no longer X. Our exposure is now program. And our outcome is no longer Y. It is called outcome. So if we make those changes, and if we run this chunk, we should see this. Um, so we still have A and B, which don't have great names, but now you can see outcome and program are there. The issue, though, is it used white text, and the O is hanging off, and the E is hanging off, so it just says utcom um, and rogran, which is not super helpful. So what we want to do instead is kind of define our own labels here. Using these kind of labels here in the formula is great because then you can remember what these things are. You could even you can use acronyms or abbreviations and say like PGM for program or whatever you want here. It doesn't matter what you type. It just has to be consistent throughout. But we can also add our own labels instead of having the labels directly on the dots here. So to do that, we add another argument inside Dagify um, called labels. And here we give it a list of, of mappings, basically, where we say the outcome is going to have this specific label, and A is going to be labeled with this specific text. So we're going to use C, which is R's way of kind of concatenating a list or making a list. That's what the C stands for. So we're going to say outcome equals um, our neat outcome. We're going to say program equals our program. We're going to say A equals confounder 1 and B equals confounder 2. And we'll actually spell it correctly. There we go. So now if I run this chunk, we have labels. And the labels don't show up. Because by default, the labels won't show up. To get the labels to show up, we have to tell our or tell ggdag to, to do that. So inside ggdag status, we'll do comma, and we can say or use, here it is, use underscore labels. And then this is just the way the function works. The only way you can know this is by looking at the documentation or looking at the examples. Um, you say text in quotes. So now if we run this, we should get 
something that looks like this. And that didn't quite work. That's cool. Let's run it again. It's because I didn't run the whole chunk. Still not working. Let's see if we can figure out why it's not working. We have true. Do, 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 do. This is good because this is like real life not working stuff. Um, Ah, I found out why. You don't say use labels equals text. You say use labels equals label. The only way you know that is by looking at the documentation or memorizing it. Um, I memorized it wrong, and so that's why it didn't work. So now if we do it, we should get the actual labels, and it should look like that. Yes, there's our program, our neat outcome, confounder1, confounder2, all nicely on there. Um, so that's good. So... This is kind of redundant now because we still have this rogren and um, outcome that are labeled, but we don't need the we don't need the text on the actual dots anymore. So we can take that off. There's an argument that says um, use. No, nope, it's just text equals false. So that should turn off the text in the actual nodes. So all we're left with are the labels, and that looks a lot cleaner and everything's nice. If this was more zoomed out, you'd actually see um, arrows pointing from the label to the node um, so that it's not exactly overlapping and it kind of works better. Um, so that is basically how you create graphs um, with ggdag. Um, you define it here with the dagify function where you have all of the different nodes. You describe the relationships between all of the nodes here using this formula syntax. Um, you can define things as um, exposure and outcome. If you want something to be unmeasured, then you use latent equals the name of the variable. So if you want like a history node or an unmeasured one node or something, you can do that. Um, you can add labels here. Um, again, none of these things are special. It doesn't have to be called outcome. This could very well just be cat and cat, as long as you just use the same thing everywhere. Um, it should still work and give the same graph. Go. Yep, it worked. Okay, so beyond just creating um, fancy DAGs, you can do the DAG, you can do DAG logic with these objects too. So I'm going to come down here and insert a new chunk. Um, we're going to hit enter a bunch of times so that this is more up at the top of the screen here. Um, so we want to know what we need to adjust for. Um, that's the magic of Daggety, is it tells us the, the adjustment sets we need to worry about. So there's a, there's a couple different ways we can do this. We can do this more by hand. Um, we can use a function called paths. And if we feed it our simple dag object, it should give us a list of all of the different pathways between treatment and outcome. So we have, uh, it still has cat here. Let me change that. Um, outcome instead of cat and there okay so we run that now we can come look at our paths and it'll be nicer than having cat in there so here's our pathways we have a path between program and outcome we also have thing one that's confounding program and outcome and thing two that's confounding program and outcome the arrows are pointing backwards into programs so we know that that is a backdoor so we need to adjust for thing one, and we need to adjust for thing two. Um, so that, that's how we can kind of get the, the whole list of pathways. Um, we can also use a function called adjustment sets. And if we feed the simple DAG into adjustment sets, it should give us a list of the things we need to control for. So we need to adjust for thing one and thing two in order to um, close all of the back doors between um, our X and our Y. Um, we can plot these things. If you say ggdag underscore paths um, and we feed it simple dag, it will plot all of the different possibilities, um, all of the different pathways between our program and our outcome. So there's program and outcome, there's thing one connecting them, and there's thing two connecting them. Um, notice how there's no arrow. Um, it, it hides some of the arrows that might exist. To, to get those, you can say shadow equals true. 
and if there's any arrows that are missing, it will add them. Um, so notice how those nodes disappeared. Now they're back. Uh, this just means we're not really worried about them in this pathway. It's just program leading to outcome, program leading to outcome, but through thing one. Um, so having shadow there kind of adds the missing stuff back in, um, which is good. So, um, and all of the same arguments work here. Like if we don't want those text things to be there, we can say text equals false. And then we can say use labels equals label, not text. Then it should work and it should be much cleaner with labels everywhere like that. So now you can see our outcome and our confounders and everything there. Um, so that's how you can visualize the paths. If you want to visualize the adjustment sets, you can use ggdag adjustment set. And if we feed um, simple dag into this and plot it, it should show us what we need to adjust for. Um, it says we need to adjust for thing one and thing two because they are square red or the red squares here. So that's what we need to control for. Um, notice how the arrows between them disappeared. That's because it doesn't use the shadow thing. So if we say shadow equals true, now the arrows will come back. I don't know why it hides them by default. It just does. Um, and the nice thing about that is now it shows that we have this unadjusted path between program and outcome. Um, we have these adjusted paths now because we've adjusted for thing one and adjusted for thing two. Um, and that kind of shows us what we need to control for. Um, and that is basically how you use um, Daggity for all of this stuff. Um, this is just the beginning. If you go to ggdag underscore, you'll see there's a whole bunch of different things. You can um, find the colliders. You can find the descendants in a relationship. You can see if something is deseparated or deconnected. Um, it's just got a whole bunch of different functions. You just feed it different things. Um, if you look at the documentation for all of this, it'll explain how to do it. It'll have all sorts of examples. And so just play with it and, and have fun um, making DAGs with R.